Okay. Green start in 30 seconds, uh, six times, six times, uh, six times. You just give me instructions. Any formal introduction or not? I've got my um, introduction in here, but. <laughs> yeah, I can I can give you a brief introduction. So hello everyone. Um, we have Professor John Percy who is a professor emeritus um, of astronomy and astrophysics and of science education at University of Toronto and associate of Dunlap Institute. He has a long standing interest in, in this um, field and also other interdisciplinary aspects of astronomy. So without any further ado, um, I for for the student Professor Percy for his talk. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Can you see the screen? Okay, is everything okay? Yeah. Good. Okay. Well, welcome everybody from uh, all over the world. Some of my favorite places out there. And tonight we're going to talk about archaeoastronomy. There'll be a spelling test at the end, and that'll be the first word you have to spell. Um, to be a bit more explanatory, uh, we're going to talk the astronomy of cultures uh, in the past, and particularly those that left behind no written records, and therefore we have to use the techniques of archaeology really to understand what their astronomy was all about. So I want to give you an interesting comparison here, because on the left, uh, is one of the most famous images of the universe ever. It's about a, a 10 day time exposure from Hubble looking out into the universe and the very smallest, faintest points on that diagram, on that photograph there are galaxies that are so far away that we see them as they were billions of years ago because their light has taken billions of years to get to us. So we're looking back in time and we're trying to figure out what's going on. On the right hand side is an image of the very famous uh, Stonehenge, uh, which is also far in time, but not as far back in time as the Hubble Deep Field. And again, we're looking at something that has astronomical significance, but the builders of this didn't leave an instruction manual behind. So we somehow have to try and figure out what this structure is all about and what it represents in terms of astronomy. So I'll say at the very beginning that I am neither an archeologist nor an archeoastronomer. I'm simply a plain old astronomer that happens to be interested in this topic of archeoastronomy. Indeed, I'm interested in a lot of areas in which astronomy connects with other things in culture. That's partly because I started my career at the University of Toronto Mississauga where it was a small campus with uh, only about 150 students and a couple of dozen faculty. And so I got to know faculty members from a lot of different areas and it really stretched my mind, particularly in terms of how astronomy connects with uh, other things. So um, I want to by asking what the term astronomy means to you and perhaps to other people. And because you're in ASX, the Astronomy and Space Exploration Group, I suspect that to you it means new discoveries about the universe, space exploration, cosmology, etc. But if you happen to be a member of the University of Toronto's Amateur Astronomy Society, then maybe the night sky, the constellations, the stars are what's a bit more of interest to you. But for 99% of the people in the world now and in the past, uh, their interest in astronomy has been much more in simply day and night, the way that the things in the sky uh, might possibly affect you, but don't, that's called astrology. And how all of this somehow connects with your spirituality, your religion and its uh, festivals and so forth. So we're really broadening astronomy uh, so that it touches many different areas of culture. And so to me, archaeoastronomy is a small part of what we call cultural astronomy, this much broader uh, viewpoint about uh, astronomy. So uh, if you look up astronomy in the dictionary, it now says that it's the study of the universe, which of course is what we think of astronomy as. 
And when we talk about archaeoastronomy, the astronomy of civilizations past, it somehow implies that these ancient societies observe the sky in order to study the universe. But we know quite well that that's not really what their motivations were. Uh, certainly, there was much more to it. Than so I want to start with this definition that comes from uh, our archaeoastronomer by the name of Rolf Sinclair. And he would say that archaeoastronomy is the study of how people in the past have used a phenomenon in the sky and what role the sky played in their culture. And it's very important to realize that that same definition can apply to people all over the world now. They don't all uh, have an interest in the sky because they're interested in cosmology or something like that. It's a much broader kind of thing. So thinking about what resources the sky offers to any culture, uh, obviously uh, the sky provides us with light, uh, particularly during the daytime. At night we have the moon and so forth. It governs the time of day. The sunrise, sunset governs uh, when the day. The seasons, which are so important to early civilizations, the calendar, uh, which we take for granted now, but is obviously very important. When's our next holiday coming up? Well, it's Easter. How do we figure out when Easter is? Um, how can we navigate by the sky? Something that's been of interest to people for, for millennia. Spirituality, what does, uh, what does uh, the universe mean in order? What's the meaning of life? And how does this somehow connect with the universe that uh, we find ourselves in? Then this business of astrology, whether somehow by studying the sky, you can explain the present and predict the future. Again, something that's of interest to many, many people uh, around the world. And finally, uh, the idea of cosmology. What is the, the nature of the universe? How was it created? What are the stories that different cultures have about the sky and what it means? So one of my interests is actually in school astronomy. And I know, for instance, that in grade six in this country, the uh, students study about astronomy. Now, it turns out in grade five, they study about great civilizations like the uh, Central American ones or the ancient Egyptian ones and so forth, and never really connect the fact that astronomy is tremendously important for all of these civilizations, both in the new world and the old world. So one of the problems with knowledge as uh, we deal with it now is that it tends to get compartmentalized into different subjects that are taught in different departments and so on and so forth. And it's really important to try and connect these different disciplines together. And so that's the, the philosophy I have about uh, astronomy. It connects with so many other things. Now, you may have heard this old story of the seven blind men elephant. And they all went around the elephant and one of them uh, grabbed, the, grabbed the leg and somebody else the trunk and somebody else the uh, tusks and somebody else the tail. And they all got completely different impressions of what an elephant is all about. Now, if all those seven people had got together and talked about it for a while, maybe they would have figured out a little bit more what an elephant really is. And the same thing happens with archaeoastronomy. It's a very multidisciplinary field. And yes, it does involve astronomy, but it also uh, involves archaeology, anthropology, ethnology, that is talking about uh, the oral history of civilizations today, uh, the written history of some that you read about in your textbook and so forth, and a big element of statistics and probability and probably a whole bunch of other things as well. It's a hugely multidisciplinary field and it works much better if different disciplines work together. And that's the way that it's really approached right now. And you can get into big trouble if you uh, start proclaiming theories without checking them with other people as well. So um, to quote another archaeoastronomer, Clive Ruggles here, uh, he describes archaeoastronomy as a field with academic work of high quality at one end, but uncontrolled speculation bordering on lunacy at the other. And I'll give you one or two examples. One um, is the sort of pseudoscience that unfortunately you see too much of on cable TV these days. But even experts such as Gerald Hawkins, uh, 
a perfectly uh, acceptable professional astronomer came up with his theory of Stonehenge and it very much represents the viewpoint of uh, one of those blind men who was only investigating the tail of the elephant. And, uh, he could well have uh, consulted other people and perhaps wouldn't have uh, developed a theory that was quite as extreme. And with my education hat on, uh, I wonder whether one of the problems is that our our education system these days is a little bit too specialized. As you might know, there are universities, particularly liberal arts colleges, and places like Har Harvard, that have a, a much more liberal uh, approach in which for the first year or two, you take a much broader range of, uh, of subjects and you get a much perspective uh, on things. So let us start with perhaps the most basic thing about astronomy as far as ancient civilizations were concerned. And that is simply the way that they could use the sky as a clock, calendar, and a compass. And so this picture here is the most basic uh, approach to astronomy. We know the sun rises in the east, it goes high up in the sky in the south, uh, if you're in the Northern hemisphere like we are, and then it sets in the west. In the winter, the sun doesn't go up very high in the southern sky. In the summer, it goes up much higher, though it's never completely overhead. And so we define, for instance, the, uh, the, the direction of south as uh, noon, or we define noon as being when the sun is the direction of south. And we define the interval between sunrise and sunset uh, as our day. Now, I had an interesting experience a week or two ago when we went on daylight saving time and I got a phone call from the CBC who was asking me whether when we go on daylight saving time, does the sun actually rise an hour uh, later? No, the sun just does its, re its regular old thing. And uh, using daylight saving time as opposed to standard time is a perfectly cultural thing. So daylight saving time is simply a cultural Thing. It's the way that our particular uh, jurisdiction relates to what's happening in the sky. So, of course, the sun is very important here. It tells us which direction is south. It tells us what, when is noon and so on and so forth. And so we're still familiar with the way that the sun can be used to tell time by a simple, uh, simple sundial like this one here. So that's how the sky is uh, clocked. And now it's also a compass, because uh, as every Boy Scout and Girl Guide knows, uh, if you use the two end stars on the Big Dipper, the so-called pointers, and you project them five times their own separation, then you can find the North Star. The importance of that is that the North Star is almost exactly due north. So navigation. Uh, what you may not know is that the angle of the North Star above the northern horizon is equal to your latitude. So it's also usable for navigation in that respect as well. So um, a very basic kind of thing. Now, saying that we're lucky, we live in an era in which the Earth's axis of rotation actually points to a reasonably bright star called Polaris. And so we do have a North Star. Uh, there isn't a South Star in the Southern Hemisphere. And for most of the time, there isn't a North Star in the Northern Hemisphere. We just happen to be at a time when the Earth's axis is pointing to a bright star in the sky. Now, perhaps the most famous of the uh, astro navigators were the Polynesians who had to navigate literally thousands of kilometers in the Pacific Ocean. And they did so using a combination of methods that we know the stories are still handed down from generation to generation as they are in so many uh, civilizations. So we know that they use not only the sky in the daytime and at night, but also the clouds, the ocean currents, the birds that they could see, the fish that happened to be swimming by and so forth. And they use this holistic information about their environment here in order to be able to navigate in these, uh, these huge distances over a virtually empty ocean. So uh, not surprisingly, uh, a stamp was issued in their honor, as you see here. And what about the sky as a calendar? Well, uh, this particular diagram illustrates the fact that as it goes around the sun, we see the sun 
against different constellations uh, in the sky. And uh, there are, by the way, 13 of them, not 12, as the astrologers say. Uh, one poor constellation, Ophiuchus, got missed out completely here. But the point is that if at a certain season, uh, the sun is seen against a certain constellation in the year, uh, constellations that are exactly opposite that will be the ones that you see at midnight. So if you know what constellations are visible at midnight, you will be able to tell what part, what season it is that is, the earth is in its orbit around the sun. And so ancient civilizations were very familiar with what constellations were visible at night, uh, simply for these practical reasons here. This is more complicated diagram here, but it's another aspect of seasons. And that is, as I showed you on an earlier slide here, that in the uh, winter time, the sun rises south of east and goes very shallow up in the south and then uh, sets about uh, four hours. So the day is only about eight hours long. Whereas on the first day of summer, the sun rises far to the north of east, goes up much higher in the sky, uh, stays above the horizon for about 16 hours and then sets to the, uh, to the uh, north of west. So if you make the rising point of the sun during the year, you can keep track of the seasons or if you measure the setting point of the sun on the western horizon at different times of the year, uh, then you can tell what season we are at. And that's very important, of course, if you're doing agriculture or if you're depending on hunting or the flooding of the Nile, as the Egyptians uh, needed to know and so forth. So these are other indications in the sky that you can use to figure out what time of year it is and therefore um, what your uh, local, uh, what your activities should be. And so remember that time, calendar and direction and the use of uh, these different sky methods, high technology, if you look back thousands and thousands of years, they're as important to people then as the computer is to us now. So let's look for a little bit about some origins. The first thing I want to remind you is that everything on earth today has developed over the last billion years, the uh, last four billion years um, it, together. We are, uh, we are related to every other species, every other being, every other culture that exists on earth today or is ever. Uh, and indeed, if there are civilizations on other planets around other stars, we share a great deal as to our cosmic origins. So that's just one message I always like to get across. Now, one of the interesting things that scientists have discovered is that there are species like monarch butterflies, like sea turtles, um, many kinds of birds, which make incredible migration journeys from the northern hemisphere to the southern hemisphere, literally over 10,000 kilometers. And we wonder, how, how can they do this? How can they remember uh, what they're supposed to be doing in order to get back to the places where they need to go? And we certainly know that they use the sun. Uh, we suspect that they use the Earth's magnetic field. And there's also even some evidence that they use stars as part of their navigation. So the question is, is this the first astronomy that took place on the Earth? It's um, an interesting thing to think about. Now, in terms of things that our direct ancestors would be involved in, here we get into the real archaeology here. So, for instance, on this picture here, there's some evidence that carvings on the bone here were a way of marking out the, uh, the monthly cycles of the moon. And so it's basically a calendar that's carved onto a piece of bone. Now, the problem is that uh, we don't know for sure that that's the case. There's no written records there. The evidence is somewhat indirect. We have to depend to some extent on the expertise of uh, archeologists that um, have studied things like this. Likewise, there are uh, paintings within this very famous cave in France, the Lasso Cave, uh, which have been interpreted as, uh, uh, as, as stars and constellations. So again, we don't have any of these people still around to tell us that that was or wasn't the case. Uh, 
we can only depend on what archaeologists know about this particular culture. The fact that uh, we know that astronomy was very important to all early civilizations, so it wouldn't be unreasonable if uh, indeed these turned out to be pictures of important constellations, because there are similar uh, paintings in, for instance, Australia and other places where indigenous people have uh, made paintings on cave walls. Uh, which brings us to the question of these cons these cosmolo cosmology and creation myths. Um, everybody's interest in trying to understand what our origins are, the meaning of life, that's the whole basis of religion, I think, and of spirituality in general. And of course, the possibility of being able to predict what the future is going to bring. And so this idea of astrology is something unfortunately still with us today because it has no scientific basis, but certainly it's existed all over the world um, for thousands of years in the past, whether it's in China or India or um, in various other places. And as I say, it's still with us today. So there's a connection then between the sky and ideas of the afterlife. Uh, that's something that's uh, certainly reflected in famous uh, Sphinx in Egypt here, which is aligned so that it faces the east, and the east is where the sun rises in the morning, having gone down through the underworld, rises back up again, sets in the west, goes down under and back again. So uh, we have this connection then between what's happening in the sky and what we believe are uh, gods, whoever they are, uh, are or where they are. So you note, know, for instance, that the word heaven is where the gods are, but we also use the term heavens to represent the sky. So there's this direct connection then between the sky and religions. And it occurs in many, many different forms uh, around the world. Here's an interesting structure in, in Ireland called Newgate Grange. And uh, it's one of Mary, many uh, chambers. Uh, you see a picture of it on the bottom there. It's quite large, uh, but it's built in such a way that on the first day of winter, the winter solstice, the sun, assuming it's clear, the sun will shine into this particular tomb and illuminate the inner parts of it. Uh, this is something that's also found in many other sites of the world. And it's not just in, in the British Isles that we find this, um, though it's certainly uh, quite dramatic in places like this and Stonehenge and other places like it. So Stonehenge, for instance, dates back about 5,000 years. It was built over an interval of uh, about 1,500 years um, by uh, not quite the same cultures, but ones that to each other. And there's a huge amount of archaeology being going on around Stonehenge for the last uh, 10 or 20 or 30 years. And it's clear now that Stonehenge represents uh, a sort of shrine for the dead where people from all over the British Isles came uh, on the winter solstice to honor their ancestors and uh, to the rituals that went on. And there's evidence, for instance, that whatever people came to Stonehenge, they went to some other sites much further away in the British Isles uh, to do similar kinds of, uh, of rituals. So it's, it's, there's, the Stonehenge is in no way unique. Uh, this is just one more example here. There's about 200 places in the British Isles where you find either complete circles of stones or partial ones like this of them are almost as impressive as uh, a stone hinge is. And again, there's this the constant evidence that it's somehow connected with their spirituality, with their desire to honor their ancestors and, and so forth. And the interesting thing about it is that Stonehenge and many of these other uh, features are aligned, aligned in the same way that Newgrange was in the sense that at a certain time of year, usually the summer or winter solstice, um, the sun aligns with these structures here. So on Stonehenge, for instance, there's um, a separate stone that's, uh, that's uh, tens of uh, meters away 
which lines up with uh, the middle of Stonehenge um, to uh, to site on the winter solstice, uh, sunrise or sunset, uh, and so forth. Now, one of the things that I like to do, and particularly during the lockdown that we've had for the last year, uh, is watching documentaries about archaeology, particularly ones about uh, uh, about the UK. Uh, there's the really interesting series on archaeology produced by the BBC and so forth. And one of the things you find is that the archaeologists, uh, if they discover burials that are aligned east-west, they can be pretty sure that whoever was buried there were Christians, so that this is something associated with the Christian phases of the Great Britain, associated with the Roman phases or the earlier phases that were much more pagan. And so even in the Christian tradition, the orientation of churches, the orientation of burials uh, is something that is aligned towards the sky, because if you read the scriptures and you interpret them, then the second coming of Christ would occur from the east. And that was very meaningful to the civilizations that uh, were around at that particular time. Now, think of the sky as we see it in Toronto, which is about 45 degrees latitude. But if, for instance, you were at the North Pole, where the axis of the rotation of the Earth is sticking straight up, then the whole of the sky would revolve around you parallel to the horizon. Nothing would set, nothing would rise. And so it follows that the civilizations there, the Inuit and the uh, Sami and Lapland and so forth, would have a completely different perspective on the sky and how it could be used for practical purposes. And there's this wonderful book published by the Royal Ontario Museum called The Arctic Sky, which contains all sorts of interesting stuff about uh, Inuit star lore and how they use the sky for practical and spiritual purposes. If you were on the equator, on the other hand, then the sun ri virtually rises straight up from the east and sets virtually straight down in the west, and indeed can be directly over. In Toronto, the sun is never directly overhead, but as long as you're anywhere within the tropics, then at least at one time of the year, the sun can be directly overhead. And that was particularly meaningful to the people in Mesoamerica um, for whatever reasons, again, for spiritual reasons. And so this is something that's uh, built into their civilization is things that relate to when the sun is directly overhead and could therefore shine directly down into a well. Uh, that's one way that you would be able to uh, observe this. Now, the Mayans uh, from Central America are a particularly fascinating culture because they were uh, not only fascinated by the sun and the sun cycles uh, throughout the year, but also by Venus, which the sun and the moon is the third brightest object in the sky. And so they had separate calendars for the sun, the 365 and a quarter day calendar, but then also the, the uh, appearance of Venus is covered by a 260 day cycle. And so their uh, timekeeping was even more complicated than other civilizations are our own. And they had very sophisticated calendars. Uh, one way of indicating that, unfortunately, most of the Mayan records were actually destroyed by the Spanish conquistador, um, unfortunately. And there's only three or four uh, documents that are left over. And this is one of them here, uh, the Dresden Codex. And virtually all the information on it is about astronomy. It's their calendars, it's their astrology, their obsession with Venus and with the sun. And if you happen to remember back to December 21st, 2012, maybe you don't, that was the day that the world was supposed to come to an end because both the calendars of the Mayans were going to turn over at the same time, kind of like the odometer of your car turning over from all nines to all zeros. And the world was supposed to end, but it didn't. And obviously none of us thought the world was going to end uh, um, anyway. But uh, there's always people with strange beliefs, as you know. 
Another interesting uh, New World civilization um, are the Nazcans from Peru. These are the plains of Nazca here. And on the plains, there's these giant areas uh, of insects and birds and other such things. And then there, there, is, there are these lines which seem to be oriented towards the horizon and so forth. I'm gonna mention these again on the next slide, but uh, they're very simply made. Uh, all that's done here is to uh, push aside the stones on the desert floor to make these particular patterns, which uh, could then be observed from nearby hills. Um, and we still have some evidence that that's the way they were used. The, the elders, the priests would go up on the hills to observe these sacred figures here. Uh, unfortunately, a chap by the name of Eric von Doniken came along with a very strange set of theories about uh, not just Nazca, but the Mayans and the Egyptians and all of these things here, and uh, tried to convince us all that these were all done by uh, space aliens. Now, he actually wrote the first of his books while he was languishing in prison because he'd been convicted of embezzlement and fraud, but he obviously figured out a better way to uh, make money from gullible people like the still buy the books and still watch the documentaries that are on these uh, uh, channels, which I will not mention. Uh, the problem is that people are very interested in this kind of thing, so pseudoscience uh, sells very well, but if you spend five years writing a rebuttal, uh, tends not to sell very well unless you happen to be Carl Sagan. Right here in Toronto, uh, astronomy has probably gone back about uh, 12,000 years. We know that the indigenous uh, peoples were here 12,000 years ago. Uh, we know something of their astronomy now. It's part of their holistic uh, understanding of their environment. Uh, in which things that happen on Earth are uh, to things that happen in the sky. The sun rises in the east, the si sun sets in the west, and so on and so forth. And so astronomy is uh, an important part of Indigenous spirituality even now. If you've ever gone to an Indigenous ceremony, uh, you will probably know that. And there's a structure called the medicine wheel, uh, which is very common across North America. It's simply a, a pattern of stones that's oriented towards north, south, east, west. And uh, again, it's part of both their practical and their understanding of astronomy. And you may be interested that Toronto's famous sign uh, has now got added to it on the left hand side here this representation of the indigenous. Uh, the medicine wheel. That's what this four part circle is, is all about here. It's in celebration of the spiritual understandings of our indigenous people. Probably the most famous of the medicine wheels is uh, in Wyoming, uh, the Bighorn medicine wheel at an altitude of about 10,000. And we know from the oral history and interviews with elders that. Uh, in the springtime, they go up there to celebrate, to, uh, to uh, set their calendars by the orientation of these cairns of stones. Uh, you can see them there. You can see uh, pattern stones radiating from the center of that medicine wheel out towards the, uh, towards the periphery of it. Uh, so that's a particularly good example. But as they say, there are uh, probably 200 of those uh, in Western Canada and the US. Now, astronomy is connected with cultures all over the world. This happens to be uh, a representation of the New Zealand Maori culture. Uh, we mentioned the Polynesians and their ability to navigate. And one of the places that they navigated was to New Zealand. They established a uh, uh, settlement there about a thousand years ago. Uh, the Maori people. And so uh, the Maori uh, astronomy is very much connected with a star class, the Pleiades, sometimes called the Seven Sisters. And so their uh, ceremonies center around uh, what they call a Matariki. Uh, and Stardome is the major astronomy center in New Zealand here. And because the Maori make up almost 10% of the population of New Zealand, uh, they have a little bit more clout than our 
uh, indigenous people do here in Canada. And so uh, their astronomy is celebrated in New Zealand as uh, well it should be. So turning to a slightly different way in which uh, astronomy is related to cultures, um, you know that there are stars in the sky and they have various patterns to them and different cultures have established different patterns. The ones that we use are the ones that descend from the Greek and Roman mythology. Uh, there's a total of 88 constellations uh, that we uh, recognize, same as the number of keys on a piano. And so testing that only the ones visible from the Northern hemisphere have these names from Greek and Roman mythology. Uh, the ones in the Southern hemisphere that were not observed by uh, uh, Western cultures until explorations of three or years ago, uh, they were named after things from the Industrial Revolution. There's actually a constellation named after the air pump and another one after the telescope and another one after the microscope and so forth. But uh, the point is here that these constellations to the Greeks and Romans represented their mythology, their, uh, their cultural stories. They were written on the sky very much in the way that medieval cathedrals with their stained glass windows portrayed the stories in the Bible uh, for the people who went there who uh, were not literate, but they had these stories on the stained glass windows and they would be able to remember the stories of the Bible. Just like we look at the constellations and we remember the stories of Greek and Roman myths like this. But there's nothing special about these constellations. Uh, they're very pretty, the ones that uh, we conform to here. These are the ones in the northern sky with the great bear and the lesser bear, and so on and so forth. But for instance, Chinese constellations are quite different. Uh, this is a star globe from the uh, ancient observatory in Beijing. And on there are the little constellations. Uh, they're smaller, more numerous than the Western ones were. And as I'll mention shortly, uh, the Chinese astronomers were making records of things that happened in the sky. And so if they something was observed in one of their particular constellations, then that localized that particular event very, uh, very uh, precisely. And we can now go to their records and, um, and recreate some of the things that uh, they observed um, up to 2,500 years ago. So let's quickly look at a few of the astronomical phenomena that we know today and kind of speculate on how they must have affected uh, ancient people. So here's a beautiful picture of the Milky Way. Sadly, uh, probably most of you have never seen this because with city lights, it's uh, completely washed out. But if you ever get somewhere where you've got a clear dark sky, you see this uh, beautiful pattern in the sky. And if you want to know how uh, different civilizations have interpreted this, just go to Wikipedia and they have about two dozen Milky Way myths from different cultures. Uh, it's interesting that the interpretation that each culture places on this uh, is very much dependent on what uh, is important to that culture and where they're located and uh, how they, uh, what sort of agriculture they do and, and so forth. So again, the interpretation would be connected with other things to do with that particular culture. Here's the Northern Lights, certainly known to the Inuit and the Sami and Lapland and uh, in Finland and so forth. Uh, it boggles me to think about how this would affect a civilization that had no understanding of how the sky could suddenly light up and dance in all the different colors of the rainbow. And, and a comet. Comets appear um, more or less randomly. There are a few that are periodic, but basically they relatively suddenly appear in the sky like the finger of God. Uh, pointing down to something or other, perhaps being some kind of omen. So on the bottom, for instance, is part of the famous tapestry called the Debeu Tapestry, in which Halley's Comet was, was recorded uh, as coming at the same time as the Norman invasion of Britain and being either a good uh, omen for the Normans or a bad omen for the Britons, whichever side you happen to be on. 
eclipses of the moon. And by the way, there's an eclipse coming up in June. Uh, it won't be total. You'll have to wait till 2024 for that. But uh, during a total eclipse of the moon, the moon moves into the shadow of the earth, virtually disappears except for a red color from light that uh, somehow gets into the shadow around the edge of the earth through its atmosphere here. So imagine if the moon suddenly turned blood red, uh, how would you interpret that? What kind of omen is that for your particular culture? You can't blame them for interpreting this in uh, very profound ways, even more so for an eclipse of the sun. Now, eclipses of the sun are very, very rare at any particular location, whereas eclipses of the moon uh, do occur every few years at any particular location. But imagine what uh, you would feel if the sun suddenly over the course of a few minutes were to vanish from the sky, leaving you with something that looked like this. Uh, utterly spectacular and uh, certainly recorded a number of times in ancient history when it had a profound effect on things going on on the earth at that particular time. The moon, of course, is something that's always visible to us. Uh, we tend to look at the moon as we see it here in the lower left, where we see the person in the moon, the face that you make of the person in the moon. Equally, you could do the top right there. That's Lucy from the Peanuts comic strip there. The one on the bottom right, I guess that's a dead rabbit or something like that. But again, the, 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 the things that you put on the face of the moon depend on what's meaningful to your particular culture but you would certainly pay great attention to the moon because every uh, 29 and a half days, it provides you with a great amount of light in the night sky and so forth, and provides you with yet another cycle to go along with the yearly cycle of the sun. And uh, here then are the phases of the moon that you all know and love, you can all word the phases of the moon as it goes through new to full moon to uh, new moon again. These were very important to the indigenous people, of course, because uh, they had to function in the outdoor environment. And so they had different names for the different uh, full moons that occur during the year. Uh, but the only one that survived now is the harvest moon, which is the full moon that occurs closest to the autumnal equinox important because, of course, before uh, electric lights, the full moon provided light in the evening when you wanted to do as much of your harvesting as you possibly could. Now, that brings us to the calendar, because the calendar is something that probably connects to more people across the earth than any other aspect of astronomy other than perhaps day and night. And different cultures dealt with the calendar in different ways. Now, the problem with calendars is that there's not an integral number of days in the year. There's 365.2422, which is exactly why do we have an, a complicated system of leap years, that aren't leap years and century years and blah, blah, blah. And we have the monthly cycle of 29.53, which doesn't divide into three five in any uh, even kind of way. So different cultures have uh, approached this in different ways. In the Islamic calendar, they simply have 12 months of 29.5 days. That gives them a year that's 354 days long. Not quite 365, but that's okay. Uh, there's the Christian calendar that we use where New Year is basically the winter solstice. Easter, which is just about to come up in a couple of weeks, is based on both the moon and the sun. Uh, Easter Sunday is the Sunday after the first full moon after the vernal equinox. So that's the formula that we use to set the calendar for billions of people. And the um, calendar is also based on both the moon and the sun, but uh, there you have to alternate between 12 and 13 month 
uh, years in order to keep the length of the year at 365.2422. So obviously very complicated, but obviously very important because this is uh, of uh, significance to so around the uh, around the world. Now, I want to finish up by mentioning a few things that don't actually uh, fit into archaeoastronomy because they deal with cultures that did leave behind uh, written records. Um, one of my favorite uh, items in the whole world here, the uh, astronomical clock in the main square in Prague in, Czech, in, in the Czech Republic, uh, built in medieval times, but yet able to uh, represent the sky complicated way here, um, pr providing us with sunrise, sunset, um, and all the other things that we might be interested in doing, all using uh, pre-Copernican understanding of the sky. Uh, Chinese astronomy here, um, dating back at least 5,000 years, uh, oriented particularly to uh, be able to detect unevent and unexpected sky events uh, because they were possible omens that uh, the so society should know about. Um, therefore, lots of astronomers employed by the court, and if they could do their jobs, then off with their heads. That was apparently the uh, uh, the process. And uh, one of the things that they did was to record comets and supernovas. Uh, uh, which occurred um, unexpectedly. And one particular recorded in 1054 AD, uh, we now know is, as the uh, Crab Nebula, this is the remains of a star that <laughs> a thousand years ago uh, in what we call a supernova. Uh, Indian astronomy, uh, very important for, for uh, astrological reasons, but doing their predictions that they needed to do. They had to develop the mathematics that was important uh, in order to do these things here. Um, so uh, if you've ever been to India, you will know about these incredible structures here that are uh, in many of the main cities like, uh, like New Delhi and so forth. And finally, Islamic astronomy. The Islamic astronomers who preserved the knowledge of the Greeks and Romans uh, uh, after the decline of the Roman Empire. Uh, they continued making observations using instruments that they developed themselves, uh, like this very sophisticated observatory on the left-hand side, pictured on this Russian stamp here uh, in Samarkand. The frontiers of archaeoastronomy, understanding the great African cultures that we don't know quite enough about. <laughs> there we go. Okay, uh, of which one is Great Zimbabwe, this uh, civilization dating back almost a thousand years. And finally, are we so smart today? No, well, if over a third of Americans believe in astrology, over a third of Americans believe that space aliens have lived. over a third of Americans believe that in Young Earth creationism, the Earth uh, universe is a few thousand years old, and very few people really understand what the cause of the season is. But anyway, uh, let's get on to the questions here. <laughs> what have we got? Let's see. Uh, feel free to add questions into the chat. There was a question. Uh, or there, uh, yeah, Duane, feel free to uh, lead this discussion. Yeah. Um, so there was one question, Professor. Um, Clay asks that do planetary names in general share the same meanings across various civilizations? Say it again. Sorry. Um, so, oh, sorry. Um, so Clay asks um, whether the planetary names in general share the same meanings across various civilizations. For example, in the West, Mars is named after the Roman god of war. In Chinese, name of for the Mars is also named 
for the early Chinese god of, of war. So he's basically asking if the names share the general meaning. Well, I think I can say two things about that. One is that there was uh, certainly communication between China and the uh, Greek and Roman civilizations, and also with the Islamic and the Indian civilizations. So um, it's quite possible that information went back and forth uh, and that each culture was aware of what the other culture was doing. But the other thing is that remember that Mars is a colored planet and red is the color of war. And so it may well have been that they independently came up with the same name. I, I don't actually know what the answer to that question is. Um, likewise, Venus is white and bright and uh, associated in the Greek and Roman mythology with love. And it may well be that other civilizations would have made a similar interpretation. But my guess is that generally the different civilizations would have attached different names to it. Just as they had different uh, myths about the Milky Way, different myths about the uh, Northern Lights and other astronomical phenomena. They somehow wanted to connect those phenomena to other things within their own culture. Thank you, Professor. Uh, somebody has asked whether, since the poles are shifting, what do you think that means for astronomy and navigation as we know it going forward um, in any effect at all? Well, of course, now we know it use GPS for navigation. We don't really use the North Star. But there are still civilizations on Earth that don't have GPS. And for them, the North Star um, does provide some useful practical and spiritual um, spiritual kind of uh, uh, function. And the civilizations in the Southern Hemisphere have managed perfectly well without a South Star. I was just wondering if the professor could elaborate a little bit on the, uh, the Aboriginal medicine wheel that, that he described and how that relates to, to the stars. Well, I don't know that much about medicine wheels other than they're oriented uh, north, south, east, west, which of course are the primary compass points, which would have been important in any way of, uh, of describing the sky for practical purposes of uh, finding direction or knowing where the sunrise or sunset were, were going to be. And Having been to one or two Aboriginal ceremonies, where they always begin with the blessing of North, South, East, and West, and give you some sense as to why that is, then I'm aware that they, they do actually have a, a fundamental spiritual meaning as well as a practical one. But it's the same ideas that seem to occur uh, all around the world. The fact astronomy can be a clock, a ca calendar, and a compass, and therefore is extremely important to every civilization. And at the same time, there are these mis mystery questions about uh, the gods and about the, the, the meaning of the sky and how it relates to the earth and so forth. Sorry, I can't do any better than that. <laughs> um, thank you, Professor. Um, Maybe the next person can go ahead with that question. Um, Lauren Gallagher. Is that the one who said he had uh, taken a course from me? 1969. Oh boy. <laughs> yes, my question is, is if the uh, bird migration could be affected by the magnetic earth would the wandering of the poles make a correlation to changes in the birth flight? And could you actually say that those numbers were so true that you could actually say one is causing the other? Well, the problem is that the wandering of the poles is sufficiently slow compared to the lifetime of a typical bird that uh, it may be that the birds kind of uh, take this into account from generation to 
generation. So they know what the changes are, so they pass it on. Uh, it's, it's presumably passed on from one generation to another, but not to uh, 10 or 100 generations at a time. So it may be a sufficiently slow change that uh, it wouldn't have a significant effect. Thank you. Hey, Professor, um, just want to say I really enjoyed the lecture. Um, do you have any more, uh, like, how, did, for that, uh, what's it called, the clock in Prague, how did they manage to make something that replicates uh, the skies so well, even without, like, uh, you know, the Copernican knowledge of the sky? Uh, which civilization are we talking about here? The, the, uh, that, the clock in Prague. Well, it's because if you're trying to duplicate actual positions and motions in the sky, those are independent of what theory that you actually use to explain them. So all you have to do is to devise a mechanism that can basically reproduce the different motions that are occurring, the motion of the moon and its uh, monthly phases and uh, the motion of the sky at the particular latitude of Prague. So it doesn't require a theory. <laughs> it just requires a mechanism in order to reproduce the way the sky is moving. The sky, of course, doesn't know what theory we're using to explain it. <laughs> The point being up until the time of Copernicus, the, uh, the Earth-centered theory uh, represented the sky just as well as the sun-centered theory did. <laughs> and it was only the precise, the more precise observations of particularly uh, Tycho Brahe and uh, the accumulated observations by the Islamic astronomers over uh, almost 2,000 years that enabled you to be able to distinguish between the two theories. In fact, the argument for the uh, Copernican theory is much stronger by using the observations that Galileo made through his telescope, the observations of the moon, the observations of the moons of Jupiter, particularly the uh, phases of Venus. Those are ones that be explained by the Earth-centered theory, they had to be explained by the sun-centered theory. Thank you. Somebody's asked about sources, and I might say that the entry in Wikipedia is actually quite good. <clears throat> it's not always the case with topics like this, but in this case, uh, I can recommend what Wikipedia has to say. Uh, there, is a, there is a handbook on astronomy by Clive Ruggles, which is a kind of Bible of the subject for people who are experts in it. Um, Professor, we do have two questions. So for the first one is that, are there any ancient sites aligned to solar eclipses? Um, well, one of the things that's claimed in Gerald Hawkins' book, Stonehenge Decoded, is that Stonehenge could be used to predict eclipses, but that's uh, not generally accepted anymore. So I'm not aware of any structures that are directly related to either eclipses of the sun or eclipses of the moon. Um, another question is, do you think um, daylight savings should be done away with uh, at this point? Well, the problem is that daylight saving time is complicated by the fact that uh, if one province does it and surrounding provinces don't, and if surrounding neighbor states in the U.S. don't, it's rather complicated. But the other thing is that we have this strange system called time zones and different provinces and territories relate in a different way to 
their time zones. Sometimes the uh, uh, sometimes the longitude to which the time zone is connected, like Toronto's, is connected with seventy five degrees. Uh, sometimes uh, your province is is well centered on that particular longitude, but sometimes it isn't. And uh, so daylight saving time is more suitable for some provinces than others. And it also depends to some extent whether it's a province who's do, where more people are out in the morning than are out in the evening, or whether it's more people out in the evening than in the morning. So you can understand perhaps that a largely agricultural province might want to have more light in the date in the uh, in the evening, right after sunrise, uh, whereas other provinces might want to have the light in the evening, uh, as we do with daylight saving time. So it, it's actually a complicated question. Um, yeah, indeed. So we do have one more question. Um, is there any astronomical alignments regarding the fire pits in the curses at the Stonehenge site? Regarding what? Um, is there any astronomical uh, alignments regarding fire pits in the curses at the Stonehenge site? Fire pits? Yeah. Uh, well, there are a certain number of fire pits around Stonehenge, they're being discovered quite regularly. And I'm not aware that they're uh, oriented or arranged in any particular way. Uh, there, there is a, a circle of about 56 pits. I'm not sure that they're all fire pits and um, they're not all burial pits or something like that. And this is what this is one of the things that Gerald Hawkins, Hawkins proposed was somehow usable as a way of predicting solar eclipses. But um, his ideas are simply not widely accepted anymore. They're uh, grossly simplistic. Um, what can you tell about the alignment of Egyptian pyramids or any other South American pyramids? Uh, they are generally oriented north, south, east, west. And one interesting question is how they could get the orientation so exact. And I've actually seen films in which they demonstrate how with very primitive uh, technology, you can uh, arrange the orientation to better than one degree of accuracy. Um, I think we are done with the questions. If, yeah, I think that's, uh, yeah. Oh, we do have one more. Um, can you recommend any documentaries related to this topic? Um, not offhand, and this is very dangerous territory because I see far more documentaries that are, uh, claiming uh, around the work of von Doniken and various other pseudoscientists who have come up with uh, theories which are just simply have no evidence in, 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 in their favor around them. So unfortunately not, but I just say be very, very, very careful about uh, what you are watching uh, around this topic here. And as I say, I do work I do recommend Wikipedia. It's perfectly okay in this case here. Um, yeah, that's it. Um, I think Adam can take now. Yeah, just had that one last uh, announcement. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Percy, for your time. Apologies to uh, everyone as well for those technical difficulties and those interruptions by some, some of the participants. We'll be looking into running that in future events. I did have one last, uh, and uh, thank you for the support in the chat as well. I did have one last announcement if anyone here happens to be an undergraduate student at the University of Toronto. We are hiring for next year's executive uh, team. Uh, elections are, um, they will be running 
I believe a week and a half from now, um, I'll be posting the link in the chat shortly once it's uh, uh, it's available. And uh, thank you, for, thank you very much again for uh, coming to, the, to this uh, look at education talk. And I hope you have an amazing rest of the week. I'll just be posting. One, one thing that I can do is that I can mount the uh, PowerPoint presentation on my website. That is the new version of it, and I can send you the link. Would that be of any help? Um, yeah, Professor, you can. Uh, it, it, we can also link that with our YouTube video. So, like people who um, sees the video, we can um, also see the slides, and we'll also email the slides to the mailing list. So, yeah, yeah. It, yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll I'll send you the. Uh, I'll 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 mount that new version of the presentation on my website and I'll send you tomorrow morning. That's yeah, Professor, coming. thank you. Is that yeah. okay? Yeah, Professor. And uh, we'll also be posting an edited to the recording after. So for any slides that weren't visible, uh, I'll be sure to uh, edit those slides. Uh, so I'll be sure to use that in the video editing process. Professor, thank you for that. Okay, so are we done? Uh, yep, just going to send that one last link in the chat, a uh, link to ASX applications. And uh, yes, um, feel free to, um, uh, uh, one sec, uh, to uh, log up for us, uh, Sir Percy, if you don't have that uh, time. Sorry, one minute. Um, I think, Adam, if um, I do have the slide with me, um, with, so I can share mine, if that works. Oh, yep, and I've just posted the best there in the chat. And that's the graphic as well. So the link will be in the chat there, there below. Uh, thank you very much. And I uh, okay. have a great week. We'll, we'll leave this chat running for a bit. Just don't give yeah. a chance to check out that link. Take care. Bye yeah. now. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Thank you.